This is draft season. John Schmoke, Tony Pauline with you. It is all brought to you by Visa. Tony, you can find his work on sportskeeda.com. It's good to see you, man. How are you? Okay. Uh, really starting to get ready, uh, you know, for things. Start, starting, to, starting to kick in the gear, if you will. We'll be making a trip uh, in about a week or so to Dallas for the Shrine Couple game. Trips. And then... Uh, the mobile for the senior bowl. So that's always exciting. Yeah. The flights are booked. I'm looking forward to being at both. First time I'll be at the shrine bowl. And we are going to have Eric Galco come on next week to preview the shrine bowl with us right here on draft season. Check that out. This show is going to be really busy. We have a lot of news. The senior bowl had their roster reveal show on the move the sticks podcast on NFL network, but they're still adding more guys. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We have People declaring for the NFL draft. That deadline has passed, but we're still, as Tony mentioned, in that cooling off period. We'll touch on that in a second. And then we're going to have a little 1 through 24 mock draft because we know the draft order 1 through 24 with now only eight teams remaining in the NFL playoffs. We'll wrap up with that. Again, it's all brought to you by Visa. Tony, let's start with the declarations first. You have a bunch of guys you want to talk about and a lot of players, especially from Ohio State, going back to Ohio State. But talk to me about this deadline, how this process is working, and kind of where we are. Well, what happens is the deadline is January 15th. And then there's sort of like a three-day cooling off period. If you're an underclassman and you submit your paperwork by the 15th, but you haven't signed with an agent, you actually have up until January 18th to withdraw your paperwork and say, you know what, I'm going to school. And, and so that would be Cam, and Cam Ward would be the perfect example of that, right? Well, well, he's the perfect example of a guy who declared for the draft, said he was going to the draft, and then all of a sudden, you know, decided he's going back to school. He's playing at Miami. The, the problem with Cam Ward is he was in the transfer portal. Then he decided, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to go to the NFL. Gets an invite to the Shrine Bowl, and then he pulls back and he says, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to go back to college. So he kind of was all over the place. But that's why, you know, everybody waits for the list. And the league won't release it, released its list until late on the January 18th, maybe even January 19th, because the players who haven't signed with agents can we, we track that paperwork and say, you know what, I'm going to stay in school one more year. Perfect. All right, good. So now that we have the mechanics done, uh, you already mentioned Cam Ward. You could touch on that if you want. And then of shocking of all shocks, Caleb Williams officially <laughs> declares he's coming out. I know we're all blown away by this. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, he, it took him a while. And as we spoke about on this program, go back to when we had Bruce Feldman on, I'm sure he was shopping out there to look at his options to get a huge NIL deal. Obviously, you know, you look at USC, they were worse in 2023 than they were in 2022. I don't know that they're going to be a good team next year as they go into the Big Ten. So obviously, Caleb Williams not only made the decision that we all thought he would make, I thought he made the best decision for himself. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. Marvin Harrison, I think that since our last show also officially declared he's coming out again, nobody blown away or surprised by any of these things, but declarations are declarations. But Tony, a lot of Ohio State players that yeah. we sadly have spent a lot of time talking about on this show are not going to be in the NFL draft. You know, it used to be that Dabo Sweeney of Clemson was the it was the premier guy when it came to re-recruiting his own players. You remember that year that Christian Wilkins yeah, and, and Dexter yeah. Lawrence and, and Cleveland Farrell went back. Uh, C.J. Spiller got him to go back. I mean, Ryan Day, as much grief as he takes from me, he did a masterful job. T.J. Tuimilaloa, who could have been a late first-round pick, early second-round pick, going back to uh, yep. Ohio State. Hyleek Williams, the defensive tackle, who had a terrific year, day two pick, going back. Trayvon Henderson, the running back, day two pick, going back to Ohio State. Denzel Burke, another day two pick, the cornerback, going back. Uh, Lathan Raysom, the, the, the uh, safety, who's a third-round choice, going back. And Mecca Egbuka, the uh, uh, receiver who was a day two pick, going back to Ohio State. I think one of the more interesting ones was Donovan Jackson, the guard, because coming into the season – a lot of people thought that Donovan Jackson was that guard that could hop into the late part of round one if he had a good season. He did not play well at all. I think he made a great decision going back to Ohio State. Ohio State, you know, if you're interested in college football, also got Will Howard, the Kansas State quarterback, out of the transfer portal. So, uh, I mean, you know, good for Ryan Day because that's a lot of talent, a lot of talent that would have impacted maybe late part of round one in the NFL draft. Absolutely, day two in the NFL draft, no longer available in April will be on the field in Columbus, Ohio next year playing for the Buckeyes. Yeah, I'm surprised that Travion Williams decided to go, uh, Travion Henderson, pardon me, decided to go back, Tony. You know, only because it's such a down running back year, 
he would have had a real chance to be one of the first running backs off the board. Now that might not have been until late round three or early day three, who knows, but you know, he's a guy that struggled to stay healthy. I guess his calculation is yeah. I want to go back, be healthy for a whole year and then maybe, you know, punch my ticket into early day two. And the other thing is, you know, you know what Marvin Harrison, if you heard what Marvin Harrison said, he, he said, I don't want to be one of those guys that leave Ohio state, never beating Michigan. And <laughs> right. that means a lot to those players. I mean, as I said to my daughter, who was a freshman three years ago, I said, you could be one of the few classes, a uh, class of uh, of students who go through Ohio State and never beat Michigan. And I guarantee you that played a big part in it besides the fact that, yeah, OK, I'm going to give up my, you know, my NFL riches and, and maybe take a little less money in an NIL deal, which I'm sure these guys get, all got paid big time money in NIL deals because Ohio State's got great boosters. Uh, but I agree with you about Henderson. I mean, even to a Mayola, because pass rushers, edge rushers are always, you know, a priority. They're always in demand come NFL draft time. And he said, you know what? Forget about potentially being a late first round pick. I'm going to play one more year at uh, Ohio State. And he has a chance to a Mayola. I thought he played well this year. He didn't play great to really improve his draft stock. I think one of the more interesting things is we talked about all those guys who are going back to Ohio State. Michael Hall, who we're going to see at the Senior Bowl, you know, who coming into the season, many of us, including myself, thought, wow, big year. This guy's going to be a first-round pick. And he was not good this year. I mean, he just was not good. He played well against Michigan. He was very spotty. I think you're looking at a day three pick. Anyway, he decides that he's going to enter the draft off a bad year where you got Donovan Jackson, the offensive guard, who decides he's going to go back to Ohio State off of a poor season. Yeah, and look, I'll throw Denzel Burke in there too. You know, he's yeah. a guy that had a rough year in 2022. He was much better in 2023. And, you know, quarterbacks, Tony, and we, you know, we've talked about this with guys like Keely Ringo. We're going to have a conversation in a second about Kalen King in this regard. Quarterbacks can be really up and down year to year, right? You can be great one year, rough the next. I thought he was a locked day two pick, probably second round this year, Denzel Burke. And I think it's a legitimate risk him going back, to be honest with you. I thought he was one of the guys that would definitely be out in the draft this year. In a draft that's only has, you know, three or four cornerbacks that are going to go in the first round. And as we've seen in previous years, even cornerbacks cornerback sometimes that are projected as day two picks end up in the late part of round one. So like edge rushers, like offensive tackles, that is a priority position, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as NFL teams and general managers are concerned. So those guys are often overdrafted. Yeah, 100%. I'm with you. You mentioned these guys want to beat Michigan, Tony. Well, they will have a chance to beat Michigan. We'll, with it, maybe without Jim Harbaugh. We'll see how yeah. that goes over the next week. We're recording this on Wednesday. If that changes by the time this post later today, we apologize. Things go quickly in the National Football League, as we all know. But they also might have a chance to do it without J.J. McCarthy, who declared he's going into the NFL draft. Uh, no word yet on whether or not he's going to go to the senior bowl. I've been keeping an eye on that, but we haven't heard. He's one of those guys yeah. that could go as an underclassman. Uh, but JJ McCarthy making the call, he's going in. And I think Tony, it's an interesting decision given the fact, I think, Oh, I don't have it in front of me last six games. I think he only threw for 200 yards once uh, rarely throws more than 30 times in a game, but I guess he has, confidence from his agents and his other advisors that he's going to be a high pick in this draft nonetheless well maybe a couple things first thing is i was told last week he's not going to the senior bowl but this was by his team so if he goes mm -hmm. to the senior okay. bowl it would be a surprise okay i i highly doubt i'm sure jim Nagy's going to push to get him there i think it would be a good choice for him to go there i was told last week he's not at this was after he declined declared i should say he's not going to play at the senior bowl i wonder uh, why not because that would you know we talk about this all the time tony that the senior bowl can be a kingmaker especially for someone like him who is in a limiting system just because of the way jim harbaugh played to me uh, that would have been that, that that that's a no-brainer to me that's that's that strange decision it is but you also have to know the player's limitations you want to put the play you remember i i, I you know i'm gonna throw a name out there taylor mays the safety from usc who was just an, an Olympian type athlete, but had a terrible senior ball because he looked, proved himself to be a straight line athlete. I mean, he was like 240 he, pounds, right? Or something uh, like that. Huge. Yeah. If JJ McCarthy, if they feel JJ McCarthy, there's a risk of him going to the senior ball and dropping a dud, you know, just being a dud. Uh, I mean, he could drop. So it, it works both ways. I always feel they should go. You know, you want the competition. We talk about the Mac Joneses of the world, those type of players, <clears throat> but you also, <clears throat> you have to know what the player's limitations are. Now, as far as McCarthy's concerned, a couple of things. I had reported all along at Sports Skeeter that I had heard he was 
entering draft, entering the draft. And then late, I heard he was 50, 50. When I really thought, when I really sat down and thought about it, I don't think JJ McCarthy had a choice. And the reason I say that is if you look at Michigan, he's not going to lose two or three offensive linemen this year. He's going to lose seven offensive linemen, seven offensive linemen are graduating to the NFL. Even his backups, Jones and and Miles Hinton, when they came in, they were terrific players. And all seven of those guys, they're not all going to be drafted. A few of them will be drafted. A lot of them are going to sign uh, PFA contracts. And those seven guys are going to be competing for spots on NFL rosters. And if they don't make the NFL roster, they're going to be on practice squads. So that is a heck of a lot of talent blocking for him that he's going to lose. Then he loses his top two receivers. And Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson, yes, they got some great, uh, outstanding talent behind them there. Then he's going to lose a Blake Quorum, who, in my opinion, you know, not to be cliche about it, was the straw that stirred the drink of that offense there. Donovan Edwards is coming back. He's got the uh, he's got the tight end coming back. But there was just so much talent protecting him. He handed the ball off to, and he was passing the ball to, that is going to the NFL. You know, you talked about Denzel Burke what a risk it would be for what it risks him for going back to school. I think it would be an even bigger risk for JJ McCarthy, who is very likely to lose his head coach who did a phenomenal job, you know, protecting JJ McCarthy, putting JJ McCarthy into a position where he can succeed and the Michigan Wolverines can, can succeed. Now that said, I did my Michigan film work this weekend. And the more I watch JJ McCarthy, the less I liked him as an NFL prospect. Why? The less I like, I, I mean, I love his moxie. I love his confidence. I love the way he leads the defense. But when you look at it, you project him to the next level. Doesn't have a big arm. He makes a lot of questionable throws that you're able to get, he'll be able to get away with on Saturday that are going to be interceptions or pass defenses on Sunday. I, I think J.J. McCarthy, I still think he's going to go somewhere in the first round. But he better, be, he better have a real good quarterback coach. And they better be very patient with him. And they better build a system around him. Because as you said, you know, he was a guy that relied heavily on the run and had a great off, great offensive line in front of him. Uh, I just, when I reported that he was 50-50 and people were saying he should go back to school, he should go back to school. I understand that. And in, if fundamentally, that's a good thing. I just don't know that he could go back to school with all the players that he was losing, especially on the offensive line. His stock might never be higher than it is now, right? I think that's kind of what 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 the theory is there. And you know, he, you get helped by the people around you, right? A quarterback is a product of what's happening around them. And you're right. If you saw the writing on the world that a lot of the guys that helped him look good are not going to be there, maybe it didn't make sense to go back. Again, I, I don't see it would be an entirely new offensive line in front of him. Granted, you got Donovan Edwards there, but he's even taking a risk. <clears throat> going back to Michigan, yep. considering you don't know who's going to be blocking for him. And and the underlying, you know, the whole underlying current is the fact that Jim Harbaugh is very likely, unless Michigan blows him away, Stephen Ross, the my, uh, owner of Miami Dolphins, who was a, you know, a, a diehard uh, Michigan alum, blows him away with some sort of contract and some sort of guarantee. He's going to be, uh, Jim Harbaugh is going to be coaching on Sunday, and Jim Harbaugh is a phenomenal X's and O's guy. A lot of people hate him, but on the field, he's a great football coach. Yeah, what he does with the run game, with the unbalanced lines and stuff like that. He just, uh, I mean, you saw what he did in, in the game against Washington with the unbalanced lines, the big personnel, and the run game does a really nice job. Um, you mentioned Michigan, Tony. Let's start here. We have a bunch of Senior Bowl invitations accepted dating back to last week. Eight Michigan players, all right? I'm going to list them quick. You can knock anyone you want, one or two. Offensive lineman Ladarius Henderson, offensive lineman Trevor Keegan, wide receiver Roman Wilson, linebacker Michael Barrett, defensive lineman Jalen Harrell and Braden McGregor, defensive back Mike Sansasrill, and tight end A.J. Barner. I'm going to talk about two guys that a lot of people don't talk about. Michael Barrett, the, the uh, linebacker. He's small. He's going to be under six foot tall, but he's fierce. He's ferocious. He, he's got incredible instincts. He's a guy that's going to be interesting to see in those one-on-one -on -one drills against the tight ends because he's got cover skills, but he's only going to be about 5'11". So he's going to be physically overmatched. He doesn't play like he's physically overmatched, but that's the thing with Michael Barrett. You know, we talk about Colston, who's going to be a day two pick, could be a second round pick, an outstanding linebacker. Barrett's one of those guys who gets lost in the shuffle. I think he's worthy of a late round pick, a nickel linebacker. Going to be interesting to watch. Ladarius Henderson, like I said, when I, I did my Michigan film work this weekend, and when I watched Henderson at left tackle, he blew me away. Excuse me, the footwork, 
the mobility, the agility, the ability to get off the edge and pass protection, the ability to get on the second level. Really looking forward to watching Ladarius Henderson. He was a guy who came into the season with undrafted free agent PFA grades, late round grades. When I watch him, I'm looking at a guy who was definitely easily a midday three pick, could even maybe broach the late part of day two if he has a good senior ball. He was that good at Michigan. And he's not your typical, say, rumbling offensive lineman that's heavy footed, you know, that, that, that you expect from uh, Michigan. This guy moves very well. And he was outstanding in pass protection. And he was really good blocking in motion on the second level. And look, I think generally speaking, Tony, and we'll get to some of the more individual guys in a moment, the offensive line group that's going to the senior bowl this year is fantastic. You're going to have multiple first round picks, a lot of day two picks. I just think it's going to be a lot of fun watching those O-line, D-line, one-on-ones down there in Mobile in a couple of weeks. The interesting thing about Henderson is he's six four and a half. So is he a guard? Is he a tackle? Is he a guy, you know, start left tackle and maybe move him into guard? <laughs> I like the versatility of him. I like the fact that he looks to me like he can play in his own blocking system. He's also strong, but he's just another, you know, another name on that list as, as you kind of alluded to. All right. So let, let's go through some of the other senior bowl uh, invitees that have accepted. And let's start on the offensive line. Um, two guys that I think just add to the group. You have the offensive tackle from BYU Kingsley Suamatai who we know has all the physical traits in the world, still kind of learning the position a little bit, but man, you watch him and you see how if he figures things out, he could be one of the best linemen in this whole draft. Then you get to Oregon guard center, Jackson powers, Johnson, who I know some people think will be the first, you know, center taken yeah. in this draft. And then one of the guys I know you like Roger Rosengarten, the right tackle out of Washington. He had a rough national championship game, but he's heading into the draft, Tony, as, a, as an offensive tackle. And that's in addition to Tyler Guyton that's going to be there. Khaleesi Fuaga is going to be there. Um, so there's just been a lot of guys on the offensive line. But, you know, focus on those three recent acceptances, Rosengarten, Suamatai, and then Powers Johnson. Yeah, I think the national championship game uh, against Ohio, against Michigan was a, a bump on the road for Rosengarten because if you watch the film throughout the year, he was fantastic. He's mobile, but he's also powerful. You know, uh, talk about Ladarius Henderson. He's got scheme versatility. You can use him in a power gap scheme. Gap scheme. You can use him in his own blocking scheme. Want to see how tall he is. Both of those Washington tackles don't look that tall. Fanado is probably going to be a guard, a zone blocking guard. Really like Rose. I like his overall game. I have him as a second round pick. People I've talked to in the league said the latest he'll go is third round. Again, the senior ball and those one-on-one -on -one drills, as we saw last year with Dewan Jones, who uh, started the started the uh, the arrow going the right way, but he kind of kneecapped himself. I, I mean, it, it's big for him. Same things with Sumamita. Su I think he's got <clears throat> late first round potential. Yeah. Former right tackle, moved to left tackle, BYU, very athletic, related to the Pen related to Penny Sewell. He, he's got he's a big guy who's mobile, who shows the ability to pass block. Very unfinished, unpolished, if you will. But if he shows pass blocking skills on a consistent basis for all three days, he could end up in the late part of round one. And, you know, Powers Johnson talked about him a couple times, is my number one rated center, is uh, a day two pick, but teams need centers. I mean, could he be a late first round choice? Possibly. Remember, he also played guard. I mean, he was a terrific right guard at Oregon in 2022 before moving to center, and he improved his game. Uh, he's a big punch in a uh, punch in mouth type of guy, but he's not mobile. He's able to get out on the second level, redirect to linebackers, hit a moving target. He's a tough, intelligent guy that's got vers position versatility as well. Okay, a couple other guys I want to get to before we get to our mock draft here, Tony. Uh, both Miami safeties, uh, yeah. James Williams and Cam Kinchins, heading to the Senior Bowl. I thought it interesting. They kind of also listed James William as a safety slash linebacker. Yeah. And we've talked about him this year. He's a bigger guy. He's 230 pounds. So I think that'll be an interesting dynamic to keep an eye on down there. Want to see his real measurements, but I mean, he's like six foot four. I, I mean, he looks like, he looks <laughs> like a big uh, basketball forward in, in the secondary and he hits like one too. And he's smart and he moves relatively well. But again, you know, as we've seen <clears throat> those bigger college safeties are often moved into linebackers in those as a, as a one gap linebacker, and I think for him it'll be interesting. You want to watch him in the pass coverage in those one on one drills, which usually the safety struggling. But also, I'm sure if he's listed a linebacker, 
they'll put him in coverage against the tight ends. Against the against the running backs, you you want to see his mo, his mobility, his movement skills, as well as his ball skills. Williams is more your uh, I'm sorry, Kitchens is more your traditional safety. I liked both those guys coming into the season. I had both those guys graded as third round choice, third round prospects. And then Kalen King out of Penn State, the cornerback we've talked a lot about on this show, Tony. Um, he's going to be a mobile, and I think it's going to be a hugely important week for him. You know, the wide receiver DB one on ones is something we all watch. They're very tough on the cornerbacks, right? The wide receivers have all the advantages in the world in those types of drills. You know, Kalen King reminds me of almost the Keeley Ringo of this year, where I really liked him coming into the year. You weren't as high on him, I know. Um, but then I thought his last year, much like Keeley Ringo, he just wasn't very good this year, to be quite no. honest with you. He had a lot of catches. Same thing with Ringo last year for Georgia. But if he can put together a good senior bowl and show that he can cover these guys one-on-one, -on -one, he has the athleticism to be a press man corner. He'll have the chance to show that in Mobile. Huge week for Kalen King. Yeah, and he got hammered by Marvin Harrison Jr. in that Ohio State game, just got beaten up. And I, I think you can make the argument that his teammate, Johnny Dixon, the, the other Penn State corner who's going to be at the senior bowl, probably played better last year than Kalen King. And his problem, like Keely Wing Ringo's problem, is making plays with his back to the ball. You know, he does a lot of face guarding. And he's got to show at the senior ball that he can run downfield with receivers in those one-on-one -on -one drills. He can get his head back around, track the pass in the air without losing his receiver, and make a play on the ball. So I agree with you. I mean, I, I was never, as you mentioned, was never that high on Keely, uh, Kalen King. I thought he was more of a third-round pick. A lot of people had him first round. He's not played well this year. This is a massive week. This is a week that he's got to try and recover some of that draft stock that people thought he had coming into the season. All right, finally, and I don't want to go too deep in on the players because we've talked about these Washington players a ton over the past few weeks, and people are probably tired of hearing us talk about them. But Michael Penix going to the Senior Bowl, which I think was a good move for him. It'll be fun to see him going up against Bo Nix, and I'm sure they're going to be on different teams, Tony. It'll be Washington, Oregon all over again. Uh, those guys are probably sick of seeing each other. And then also uh, Jalen Polk, Jalen McMillan, and Troy Fontenu, who you mentioned earlier, all declaring for the NFL draft. So uh, these Washington players that got them to that national title game, they're going to move on. They lost their head coach, obviously, uh, to Alabama. So these will be interesting players to watch here moving forward. Sort of an interesting dynamic in the sense that, you know, Penix played for the national title. He, a lot of people thought he was right there for, for the Heisman Trophy. <clears throat> but when you move towards the senior bowl week, you're looking at Bo Nix as the guy who, if he has a good week, can slide into the late part of round one. I don't think there's too much talk about Michael Penix really sliding into the late part of round one. Terrific story. Outstanding college quarterback. You know, we want to see consistency from Michael Penix. We want to see consistent accuracy because that was one of the problems with Michael Penix. You know, the streakiness. You didn't know what you were getting from week to week. Sometimes you didn't know what you were getting from quarter to quarter, as we saw in the national championship game. Too many times passes get away from him. <clears throat> you know, he can't do, can't pull a Taj Boyd. And when I say Taj Boyd, Taj Boyd was a quarterback from Clemson that everybody loved. And even when, even during the warmups, when they were just, when the receivers were just running routes against nobody with nobody covering them, the passes would sail over the, the receiver's head. Michael Penix cannot do that during Senior Bowl week. Credit to him for going there. It's going to be great to see him there. I hope he does well. Big week for him. I know there are 20 guys here, Tony, that accepted invitations. I'm not going to waste everyone's time and by listing all of them. Anyone else that jumped out at you over the past week or so that, that that's going to Mobile that you're excited to see? Well, I know about I'm excited to see, but it's, uh, it's a guy I'm going to watch. And somebody I mentioned before was Michael Hall. Michael Hall of Ohio State, who I thought was a surprise, entered the draft off the season he had, especially when everyone else is going back to Ohio State. And the thing with Michael Hall is, in those one-on-ones, does he show any strength at the point? He's quick. He's explosive. He plays with great pad level. He uses his hand incredibly well. But he's not a big, strong guy. And he gets buried. He gets hammered at the point of attack. I mean, there are times when you watch the film that he's just getting knocked off the line against run blocks. So when those one-on-ones, we want to see if, you know, he can get penetration, if he can push uh, opposing offensive linemen uh, up the field, or is he consistently getting stoned, uh, you know, at the point of attack and, and just held up time after time. It's a big week for Michael Hall as well. Visa uses advanced AI to help stop fraud. So Brie can be all slurp, no worries. Yum. All right. You're listening and watching Draft Season, brought to you by Visa. 
John Schmelk, Tony Pauline from Sports Kita. I'm with the Giants, but this is a NFL draft podcast without a focus on the Giants specifically. Uh, we're going to do kind of one mock draft a month here, folks. We're going to do one free All-Star game, which we're going to do today. We'll do one post-All-Star game at some point in February heading into the Combine. We'll do one post-Combine sometime in March. And then we'll probably do one or two in April as we start getting some, you know, pro day stuff, uh, visits, and Tony starts getting all his intel in terms of who's going where. So that's going to be kind of our mock draft schedule. This will be probably one of five or so that we'll do before the draft. We don't want to do too many of these. They get repetitive. They get boring. So mm -hmm. for this one, we're really going to focus on the players here, folks. We know we have teams. We have needs. But guess what? Once we get through for agency, those needs are going to change completely. So we don't want to focus too much on needs now because they're going to change a whole lot. But we know who the draft, what the draft order is going to be, one through twenty-four. So Tony now will alternate. I gave him the pleasure of being the first overall pick. He took the odd teams. I took the even teams, and we're going to go through one through twenty-four again. Focus on the players, not necessarily on team needs. We'll try to go through this pretty quickly for you, so we're not here for you know an over an hour for this podcast. So, Tony, you have the Bears pick at number one. They obviously obtained this butt pick. From the Carolina Panthers in the Bryce Young trade last year, what do you think the Chicago Bears are going to do? I'm going to go with Caleb Williams. I mean, and by I the way, I should be I should be clear. This is what Tony and I think the team should right. do, not us predicting what teams will do. I apologize, Tony. Go right ahead. I'm going to go with Caleb Williams. I, I mean, he's a higher he's higher rated than any of the quarterbacks who came out of the 2023 draft. I know there's a lot of love for Justin Fields, but Justin Fields has had a, a number of seasons now to really prove that he is that number one feature quarterback, franchise quarterback for the Bears. And I don't think he's done it. And I think Caleb Williams, much to the dismay of the Justin Fields supporters, is just an upgrade over uh, Justin Fields. And I think it's one of those situations, sort of like C.J. Stroud, if you pass on Caleb Williams and he turns into the quarterback that a lot of people think he could be, you know, you're going to look back and, and you're just going to you're just going to rue the decision. Command is in number two. They need a quarterback. They're going to have a brand new regime. They already hired uh, Peters, the executive from the 49ers, to come over. New owner. You know what you start with? You start with the quarterback. They pick second. I think when all is said and done, Tony, Jaden Daniels will be very close to Drake May for a lot of teams in terms of the second quarterback picked in this draft. I have not done my full evaluation on Jaden Daniels yet. I have finished. I've watched every drop back Drake May has taken this year. He's really good. Uh, you had some worrisome things at the end of the year with some inaccuracy issues in his final couple of games against not great competition like Virginia and teams like that. But, my gosh, you want to build a quarterback in a lab from a physical perspective? Here's Drake May. He's got a cannon. He puts the ball into really small spaces in the middle of the field. Go back, watch his tape against Georgia Tech. He makes four or five throws in that game where you just sit there and you're like, Oh my gosh, th these are amazing NFL level throws in traffic layered over the middle. So I'm going to go Drake May to the commanders right now. But again, you know, I think about them picking Robert Griffin, the third, and obviously Jaden Daniels is kind of in that mobile quarterback type of mold. But for now, I'm going to go Drake May though. Again, I think when all said and done, Jaden Daniels will be in this conversation for quarterback too. You know, I I'm looking at the board, <clears throat> Marvin Harrison's the top rated player. <clears throat> By a, by a bit, be an intriguing pe uh, pick. But the history of the New England Patriots is <clears throat> they've never done well with uh, wide receivers that they've selected in the first round. And they do have a, a, a big hole left tackle. So I'm going to go with Ole Fashanu of Penn State, who is a terrific pass blocker. <clears throat> He's a mobile guy. He's good on the second level. He's good on his feet. <clears throat> He's got to get a little bit stronger. He's got to improve his run blocking. But that is often easy, much easier to do than to improve your athleticism. So I think with Fashanu, you know, he's one of those guys that could actually make the whole offense better because you're going to protect your quarterback, whoever that may be moving forward uh, with the New England Patriots. I do think Marvin Harrison would be a consideration here. I do think Jaden Daniels would be a consideration here. But this is Northeast football, and the Patriots have always done incredibly well when they had stellar left tackles. And I think that's what Fashano has the potential to be, a stellar left tackle in the league. No thought about quarterback here, Tony? I said I think they're going to consider Jaden Daniels here and they'll consider Marvin Harrison. Uh, but again, you know, regardless of whatever quarterback you get, you better have a good left tackle protecting him. And Fashano, in my opinion, is significantly 
higher rated than any left tackle available. And he's a guy that, you know, you can keep him or you can have him for 12 years as a stalwart at the position. I did not think Jaden Daniels would be staring me at the face of number four here with the Arizona Cardinals. But I think Kyler Murray showed them enough where they're going to want to stick. Uh, if they had a chance to take Caleb Williams, maybe we would have a different conversation here, but they were not in that position. So Marvin Harrison is the sore thumb on the board, Tony. He's the best player available. He's an awesome player. Uh, they need a wide receiver to help uh, to help uh, Kyler Murray. To me, this is an easy run to the podium, yeah. given your pick, and I hope nobody stops you running out of the jewelry store with your bag full of jewels, because that's basically what Marvin Harrison is. So this is an easy one. Marvin Harrison, four to the Cardinals. Charges are up. Jim Harbaugh could be there next year. This is a tough one, Tony. They could go a lot of different ways here, man. Yeah, I don't think it's that tough. I mean, you want to make Justin Herbert more effective. You got to get him more weapons. Oh, I know where you're going. Yeah, Quinton Johnston last year really didn't pan out, but we knew there were going to be a lot of issues with him. You know, you're looking at Brock Bowers, one of the highest rated tight ends to, to enter the draft in the last 10 years. He's a terrific receiver. He's tough as nails. He's a guy who can get down the seam and went out for the contested throw. He's not a bad blocker. I, I just think that <laughs> you bring Brock, Brock Bowers in. He's a guy that Justin Herbert's going to fall in love with from day one. Herbert is your franchise quarterback. He's a proven commodity. Get more weapons around him. And really, on the board right now, Brock Bowers is your best weapon. Could also help out the running game. Blocking on the second level should get better as an inline blocker as he physically matures and just gets a little bit bigger and stronger as he gets a little bit older. But I think Brock Bowers not only fits a need, but is going to make Justin Herbert a very happy man. I'm with you. And look, they have all sorts of cap issues there too. And like I said, I don't want to focus too much on needs because things could change. But there's a good chance that Keenan Allen or Mike Williams could be a salary cap casualty at some point this offseason for them to become cap compliant. And again, not to create cap space, to literally get under the salary cap, which you have to if you're an NFL team. So you're right, Tony. They could use more weapons, especially given Quentin Johnson's lack of development last year. All right, welcome to my hell. This is the question I'm going to be asking myself for the next three months covering the Giants here. Um, look, it's going to be an offensive player, okay? So now you're staring, and I think there are three or four legitimate options here that I think would be a good pick for the Giants, all right? You can make the argument for Joe Alt, the offensive lineman. You know, you've had issues with Evan Neal at right tackle. Joe Alt could step right in there. And you know, Evan Neal turns out to be a great tackle. Can you put Joe Alt at guard? Yeah, maybe. I think you could do something like that too. So I think Joe Alt's one guy you look at. The two wide receivers, Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunzier. Both really good players. I have neighbors ahead of a Dunzier myself, but I think it's close. And I think given the talented wide receiver on the Giants roster with Jalen Hyatt and Wandale Robinson, I think a Dunzier actually probably fits as the puzzle piece better into that group and Darius Slayton than Neighbors does because you have Wandale Robinson that'll play the slot. And I think Neighbors is a guy that will play the slot a lot in the National Football League. Certainly not a slot only guy, but I think you're going to want to use him in there to utilize his twitchiness, his explosiveness. And then, of course, you have the quarterback, Jaden Daniels. We, you know, uh, Daniel Jones, he's going to be here next year with the Giants, but he's coming off an ACL, right? And the way that contract is structured is not necessarily going to be a contract where the guy's here for all four years either if the team doesn't want him to be. He can be if he plays great. We'll see. So Jaden Daniels is, is an option there uh, at quarterback. But I think as of right now, this team, hey, Daniel Jones, they have confidence in him. So I'm going to go and finally get him the weapon that he needs. And I think the puzzle piece that fits, to my point, again, I probably have Joe Alt and Malik Neighbors ranked higher as prospects on my overall big board. But I think Adunze is the big better fit. So for the first iteration of this, I'm going to go Roma Adunze, wide receiver out of Washington. Makes sense. <clears throat> Makes sense. They want the bigger guy as a pass catcher. <clears throat> and the Tennessee Titans are very happy because, you know, granted, uh, we're not going by needs, but there are a lot of good players there that happen to fit their needs. You know, I, I think that Malik Neighbors has to be a consideration, but you know, going back to what I said with New England, if you want to make Will Levis, who looks like he's got the potential to be a franchise quarterback, 
a more successful passer, you got to protect them. And they need offensive tackles. And really, after Dallas Turner, who's my highest rated player, it's still available. The next guy would be Joe Alt. I think they could, you know, a pass rusher, an edge rusher would be a consideration, especially if Mike Vrabel was still the head coach there. But you got to improve the offensive tackle position. And I think they, they're in a good position where they're getting a very highly rated player in Joe Alt, who also fits a, fits a need. So the Tennessee Titans, with this selection, take Joe Alt of Notre Dame. Yeah, I knew as, long as, as soon as I left him there, Tony, I knew that's where you were going. That was an easy one. And I'm not going to lie, selfishly, I think I made it easy on myself with pick number eight by not picking Jaina Daniels for the Giants. So was there some oh. calculation there from John Schmelk? There could have been. I'm not going to lie. Um, so I think Jaina Daniels is the pick here for the Falcons. Uh, we'll see if Bill Belichick is the head coach. Obviously, he interviewed there, had the conversation with Arthur Blank, uh, according to reports. I think the Falcons actually announced that officially. But look, they can't continue where they're at with their quarterback position with Desmond Ritter and um, Tyler Haneke, like Taylor Haneke, you can't, you can't. And Jaden Daniels is sitting there. This is the run to the podium type of pick here. If Jaden Daniels wasn't available, I would consider going with the first defensive play here, Tony. They need an edge rusher. I think Dallas Turner would have been a, an option here as well. But since Jaden Daniels is there, I got to go with the QB. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, the Bears are up now, and I think the Bears are kind of in a difficult situation because, well, actually, maybe I, let, let me take that back. I, I think if if the board plays out the way we expect it to play out, the Bears are actually in a good situation. I apologize because uh, you know they need a receiver, they could use a cornerback, they could use an edge rusher, but with Malik Neighbors there, I, I think it's a no brainer. Uh, you know, whoever their quarterback is, whether it be Caleb Williams, who I had them selecting first, whether it be Justin Fields. Another weapon, another deep threat, a guy that, you know, catches the ball, runs good routes, gets separation, uh, has had two really good seasons. And as I've said, ad nauseum, LSU receivers are much better on Sunday than they are on Saturday. So the Bears with that, with this selection, take uh, Malik Neighbors of LSU. Now, Tony, I'm not going to lie. And look, a million things are going to get changed between now and when this draft happens. But I feel fairly good about these being the first 10 players taken in the draft this year. Like I look at the next group of yeah. players and uh, what, maybe Jared verse, maybe a corner. Uh, I don't know who else is going to sneak into the top 10. Could a wide receiver sneak into the top 10? Maybe. But I, I think right now the, I feel pretty good about these being the first 10 players taken. And the, uh, you know, the irony is, is the past couple of drafts have been defensive heavy drafts. And when, when you look at the board and when you look at our selections, it's been all offensive players with the first 10 selections. And it's very likely if it doesn't happen in that order, at least nine of these guys that we just went through will end up as the top 10 uh, choices. I'm sorry, nine. You're right. I'm picking 10 now with, with, with the Jets. So that would be the, the top nine. Um, and I think these are, in my opinion, um, the nine best players in the draft. At 10, the Jets are annoyed. They wanted Joe Alt to make it to them at, at 10. He did not. Uh, but they still are going to take an offensive tackle. And again, this is going to be kind of, you know, who do you like the best in, in, in this type of situation? Which guy is your favorite? You know, are you a J.C. Latham guy? Are you a Fuaga guy? But I'm going to go with the player that I think has the best chance of being a tackle in the NFL with the best feet. And I go down to two guys. Amarius Mims out of Georgia, who, again, does not have a lot of game tape. Uh, so I'm going to slide him down a little bit. I don't think the Jets want to roll that type of dice. So I'm going to go Tyler Guyton here. Um, mm -hmm. He's a guy that I know people really like his feet. They think he's going to stay out there at tackle. I thought about Troy Fontenot out of Washington, Tony, because he has that kind of guard tackle flexibility. But I think the Jets want to make sure they get the tackle. So I'm going to go Tyler Guyton here. I have not finished my full evaluation on these tackles, so these are not my final rankings by any means, and I think you have a lot of work to do here in terms of how I'm going to kind of space out this group. Latham, Fuaga, Guyton, Mims, Fotnu, Morgan. I think all these guys are interesting players. How they rank out finally, I don't know, but I'll give them Tyler Guyton for now because of the upside. That makes sense. I mean, the Jets are in a tough situation because all the offensive players are gone, and if it's not tackle and they didn't make a move to get uh, to secure Broderick Jones last year, it's going to be receiver. And they let Jackson Smith and bypass him last year to take Will McDonald. So, and it's ironic because 
in one of my early first uh, first round mock drafts, when the Jets were picking in that 10-11 area, I had them taking Tyler Guyton. And the Jets are going to need a starting left tackle and starting right tackle. And Tyler Guyton is a starting left tackle who some people project to right tackle. And he is a guy that a lot of area scouts believe can be a top 10 pick because he's so big, yet he's so athletic. And he's going to be at the senior bowl, and it's going to be an interesting guy to watch. Now, Minnesota Vikings are on the board. This is kind of easy because the Vikings are a team that, again, we don't want to talk about, we don't want to talk about needs. They're always eternally looking for a cornerback. Could be Dallas Turner, depending on what happens uh, in free agency. But I'm going to go with Kool-Aid McKistry because this team always needs cornerbacks. He's one of the higher rated players on the board. Dallas Turner seems to be stuck there with no spot. But I think uh, McKistry is a terrific player. I know you like Nate Wiggins. There's not a big spread between Wiggins and McKistry on my on my board. But I'm going to give the uh, Vikings McKistry. I like Terry and Aro too, Tony. I think he's in that mix also. I know you're not as high in him. I think when all said and done, those three are, you know, those three guys are all going to kind of be in that same type of area. I thought maybe Edge too. You know, do you like Jared Verse? Do you like Leitu Latu? Also, I think could be a deal for Minnesota here, but I'm with you. I think I think defense is the way to go for sure. All right, so let's go to the next team, the Denver Broncos. You know, they actually have a pretty good roster. You take a look at it. You have some players there. I don't think there's a quarterback here. Obviously, Sean Payton wants to move on from Russell Wilson. I don't think the answer is staring at them right here in the draft. I'm not willing to go J.J. McCarthy here. I'm not willing to go Michael Penix here. I'm not willing to go Bo Bo Nix here. So I can't go quarterback at this spot. You go back to Sean Payton's draft history in uh, New Orleans. They like to pick big guys up front. But I I think they need a cornerback you know, to, to fit in into that second cornerback spot. Obviously, they have their top corner they drafted a couple years ago. They don't need to upgrade that spot. I do think they need to upgrade the other. So I'm going to go Nate Wiggins here, cornerback, and I'm going to slide him in here as the Broncos' first-round pick. Yeah, it makes sense. I believe that's the uh, player I had them taking in my most recent mock draft. That uh, It is, in fact, uh, Nate Wiggins uh, at Sports Skeeta about a week or so ago. Think about it, Tony. Wiggins and Sertan, that is a hell of a cornerback combination there, man. Woo. Absolutely. Now, I, I mean, the uh, the Raiders, I, I think the Raiders are able to get a player that fit their, fits their needs in, in Zerhan Newton. I mean, the, the athletic, mobile, defensive tackle from uh, <laughs> Illinois, he's basically graded right where, I, where the uh, Raiders have him on my board. He's a quick, he's quick. He's not just a plugger. He can get up the field, penetrate the gaps. He can change direction, get out down the line, outside the box to make plays. The thing that really impressed me about Newton is even when the game was decided and Illinois was getting beat and they they felt fighting a line and they knew they were going to lose the game, Newton played hard. He was out there trying to make plays, even in a losing cause. He could have mailed it in because he had such a good year. And people project him as a you know top 15 pick. He didn't. I think this fits what the Raiders want to do. Uh, if, obviously, if Antonio Pierce remains the head coach, uh, it's, it's, it's a perfect fit. Uh, but I think the Raiders take Zer- Zerhan Newton with this selection. All right, Tony, I'm sitting here, and the guy that's on top of my board <laughs> is Leitu Latu, and the Saints love to take defensive linemen in the draft. It's what they do. They had to let go of Marcus Davenport last offseason in free agency. But you want to look at the type of players that the Saints like to draft, big, powerful ends that are physical? How are they not picking Jared Verse? I mean, he just seems to fit the profile that the Saints want as a defensive end. I think they need an offensive tackle. I don't like one of those players better in terms of overall grade on my board, better than I like Jared Verse or Leitu Latu. But because of the fit and what they've done in the past, I'm going to give the Saints Jared Verse, edge player out of um, Florida State. Yeah, and it's a big drop-off from defensive tackle from Newton to everybody else. Um, So uh, it it kind of uh, makes a lot of sense. Indianapolis Colts. Dallas Turner still on my board. I like Turner more as a, as a stand up defensive and uh, outside linebacker in a three, four, you know, the, the Colts use their defensive. They like those smaller, quick pass rushers. That's what Dallas Turner is. 
Uh, he's a guy that's very versatile. He's got a high upside. I think he should go very early. So the Colts fit their pass rushing need and get real good value in Dallas Turner at this election. You know what? I had crossed Dallas Turner off my board by accident. I would have taken Dallas Turner for the Saints, but that's fine. That's why we do this live. The great pick, I think Dallas Turner, he he is ranked higher than verse on my board. I just had accidentally crossed him on my big board because I think I was so set on picking him with the Falcons, and then Jaden Daniels was there, and I crossed both guys off at the same time. But no, just I think further proof of what next... Just further proof of what value the Colts got at 15. Uh, no, absolutely. And look, I, I don't think I would have taken him with any of the previous picks anyhow based on need and fit, but you know, I think Dallas Turner is a great pick there, Tony, and I would have picked him over verse as well, just uh, for the record, so fans don't aggregate me and, and make me look like an idiot here as we do our mock draft. All right, let's go to the Seattle Seahawks, Tony. Uh, they have a lot of need here as well, and I think they need pass rush. You know what? Let's start the run. We're going three pass rushers in a row. I'm going to give them Leitu Latu, the pass rusher out of UCLA. Um, I know he has medical concerns. I get all that. But I think they do need help off the edge of the Seahawks. They need a little bit more consistent pass rush. So I'm going to give them the pass rush right of UCLA. Makes sense. And, and I, I think the run continues with the Jacksonville Jaguars, who also need pass rushes. I mean, the Jaguars, you look at them, they're a team that have used a ton of early draft capital on players in their defensive front seven. Josh Allen, uh, the, the kid from... Uh, Javon Walker. Yeah. Javon Walker. Uh, Clavon Chasen, who basically is a, is a backup uh, linebacker now. <clears throat> but they still have that need <clears throat> at pass rusher. I'm, look <clears throat> I'm looking at two players. I'm looking at either Chop Robinson or Jared Verse. I'm going to go with Chop Robinson. The reason I'm going to go with Chop Robinson Well, Verse is, is gone. Remember, I, I, uh, I, yeah, Verse is on the Saints, so Verse is off the board. So that, so that makes your Good. choice you, you just, easy, Tony. You just made my job much easier. I'm <laughs> yes. sorry. I'm looking at him. <laughs> So I'm going to go, I would go on with Chop Robinson anyway. And the reason I'm going with Chop Robinson is, you know, I, I know that they play a 3-4, uh, although they line their their linebacker, their uh, pass rushing linebacker up at the line of scrimmage. Chop Robinson is much better uh, coming out of a three-point stance than many of the pass rushers that we just talked about. Maybe not Latu, who does a little bit of that, although Latu's got some medical concerns. But I think Chop Robinson brings the pass rush skill and the intensity that the Jacksonville Jaguars really need. I would have preferred to go offense here, but none of the offensive players, whether it be a tackle like Fuega, whether it be a tight end like Sanders, there's no receiver that really stacks up to where Chop Robinson is on my draft board. All right, let's go to the Bengals. Joe Burrow is hurt constantly. They need to protect that man. Jonah Williams is a free agent. Yep. I'm going to go right tackle J.C. Latham out of Alabama. It was either him or Talisi Fuaga. As you mentioned, Tony, I have them kind of right next to each other on my board, but I'll give him Latham. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. The L.A. Rams, another team that could use a young offensive tackle. Since you took Latham, I'm going to take Fuaga. I mean, you got to protect You got to protect Stafford. They're getting a little long in the tooth at that position. Uh, they could use some help in some other areas, but Fuaga is graded right up there on my board. Maybe Terry and Arnold. I don't think they they would look cornerback at that at that spot. Uh, I, I think it's a, a, a situation where the player fits the need. They could take Terry and Arnold. Uh, that that's a that's another guy that they would look at. But I think Fuega uh, with that offense is a good fit. Yeah, and then I look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, Tony, and I think when you look at needs for this team, as I look at my little list here, offensive tackle and cornerback. Those are the top two needs on my list here. A lot of these offensive tackles are off the board. I think it's either a Marius Mims uh, to move in a left tackle, but they already kind of picked a project at left tackle from the same school last year. I don't know if they wanted to do Broderick Thomas, right? I don't know if you necessarily want to do the same thing again. So what is Pittsburgh like? Tough, physical players. They drafted Joey Porter Jr., a cornerback that fits that last year. They're going to pick another tough, physical, in-your-face corner this year. I'm going to give them Terry and Arnold, the cornerback out of Alabama. Makes sense. And, and basically with, with Arnold and Joey Porter, you get two first round corners, even though Porter went in the second round last year. Uh, you know, Miami could go defense, but their head coach is an offensive minded guy. He likes speed. He likes playmakers. You you look at what they did in the draft last year with Arcane. You look at the, the trade for Tyree Kill. I'm going to throw a curveball here. And I'm going to say the Miami Dolphins take Jatavian, Jatavian Sanders, the tight end out of Texas, Ooh. my number two rated tight end. And the reason I say that is because 
now the Miami offense will have playmakers at receiver. They'll have playmakers at the running back position. And with Sanders, they now have a big time playmaker at the tight end spot. I think this is a situation where they could draft a defensive player, which fits a need. But you look at the makeup of the team. You look at the makeup of the head coach. It's speed, playmaking ability, get down the field, create mismatches. That's what Sanders does. All right, the Eagles are pissed. They're mad at me because I took their cornerback off the board with Terry and Arnold. They have a desperate need at corner, Tony. And I think the top three guys are all gone, to yeah. be honest with you. Um, you have the one from Toledo, who's still there, um, whose name escapes me, Quinion Mitchell. Mitchell, thank Quinn you. Mitchell. He's a guy I think they would consider here. I would consider Troy Fontenot here, but again, they don't like to pick non-premium positions. And if they think he's a guard, I just don't see Howie Roseman doing that. Um, I don't think they can afford to take another edge rusher or defensive lineman. They have so much invested in that position already. You know, they it's a premium position corner. That's where the Eagles like to shop. They can't go wide receiver. So I'm, I, he's not high enough on my board, but I think it makes sense. I'm going to go Quinny and Mitchell here out of Toledo, the cornerback. I have, I, you know, there's some thought that Mitchell can be a first round pick. I do have a, a Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia rated higher than him, but Mitchell's going to be at the senior bowl. And, you know, Mitchell's a guy who he's big, he's fast. He's been a good player at Toledo for three years. Sometimes he's tough to scout because opponents opposing, opposing quarterbacks just don't throw his way. So the senior bowl is big and it's not out of the question that with a big senior bowl, Mitchell ends up, you know, in the bottom part of round one, as you spoke about. We go to the Houston Texans. They need some help on defense. They need some help at defensive tackle. They're not going to go too far to get their player, and they're going to go take Byron Murphy of Texas. Good pick. You look at the head coach, D'Amico Ryans, the type of player he likes. Ryans, you know, uh, Murphy's an athletic explosive, and not, a, not the biggest guy in the world, but he is a playmaker. Uh, he's a guy that, you know, they, they like those smaller sort of one-gap defensive tackles. That's what he is. And I think Murphy, who probably isn't getting much first-round conversation as we move towards the draft, especially after the combine, a lot of people are going to be talking about him as a first-round pick. All right, final pick of the draft, Tony. Dallas Cowboys at pick number 24. Look, they're going to have some work to do on the offensive line this year. I know you're coming off a game where the defense got lit up and you figure you want to add a defensive player. But look, Tyron Smith might either retire or move on. Uh, they're probably going to lose their center to free agency, the kid out of Wisconsin. Do you move Tyler Smith out to left tackle from left guard? Do you leave him at left guard? That's a good question. Well, you know how do you make that easy? You pick a guy that can play left tackle and left guard, and then you and Tyler Smith just figure it out. I'm giving them Troy Fontenot, your guy out of Washington. You know, he played tackle great at Washington. He could stick there. Or if you like Tyler Smith better at left tackle, fine. Play Fontenot at left guard. Either way, you can't lose. Dallas has been very good at picking offensive linemen over the years yeah. in the first round. They always hit. I was dead wrong on Tyler Smith two years ago. He developed faster than I ever thought he would. The athleticism and the traits paid off. He got coached up down there. I think they're going to pick Troy Fontenot to help solidify that offensive line further. And again, if you think that Tyler Smith can, you can kick him back out to left tackle, well, which he really didn't have to play because Tyron Smith was there. You move Fontenot in uh, to guard, and you have hands down the best zone blocking guard in this year's draft, and a guy that should just really fit a power system as he gets a little bit older and, and enters an NFL weight training program, just physically matures. So I, I absolutely see the, the Cowboys, uh, you know, loading up on offensive linemen or at least filling holes on offensive linemen. Uh, because, you know, you, you got to protect Dak Prescott. I will say this, Tony, and this will be the last thing I say before we wrap. We're going a little over here. I am maybe shocked as strong. I am surprised that we did not have a fourth wide receiver go in the top 24 picks. Um, I mean, who was it was going to be Keon Coleman? Was it going to be a Donnie Mitchell who, who entered the draft? I, I think it could be Brian those, Thomas, Brian Thomas from Brian LSU, Thomas, right? But I think those guys are more bottom six picks of round one. So I think once we got into those, you know, those final picks at, at the bottom of round one, uh, you know, with the Kansas City Chiefs, things like that, maybe that's where that uh, Tampa Bay with the uh with the receivers that they could potentially lose. I think that's where that fourth receiver would go. 
I mean, the, the question is, you go back up to the Minnesota Vikings at 11. What's going to happen with Kirk Cousins? Would they consider a uh, a quarterback? Would they reach for J.J. McCarthy that early? Um, but again, you know, Bo Nix, is he, does he fit in anywhere in here? You know, there's uh, Tampa Bay, who's having a lot of success, uh, you know, at the quarterback position right now. <laughs> Do they maybe decide to take their quarterback of the future and the development, same thing with the Detroit Lions, although they're having a lot of success, you know, you got to think about the future. Um, so a lot of things to be played out that we will see at the senior bowl. Tony, this was fun. My friend next week, we'll have Eric Galco from the shrine bowl. And then we are off for a week on the road in beautiful mobile, Alabama, but first in Frisco, Texas. It's a pleasure, Tony. This was fun. Enjoy your week. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Look forward to it, John. For Tony Pauline from Sports Kita, I'm John Schmelk. This has been Draft Season presented by Visa. We'll see you next time.